So for those who don't know, I actually was planning on retiring after my Yale career just because I was I was sick of the game and I was um, tired of the stuff I had been put through. Um, but I think that my senior year coach that came in um, that started coaching my senior year, he really helped me love the game again. So that's when I started talking to the NWHL teams. It wasn't the stress and the 40 hours a week and the, the balancing of time and school and hockey and whatnot. I think for me, it, it really was the white space I was in each day. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's what became ex like, just it was so tiring. And um, I think that's what made me fall out of love with the game that that's probably the, the main part of the game that was just so tiring and and i just wanted it to end um but i think that through all this i realized that it it is my job to to be there as a voice for other women of color who are coming up in the game and in sport in general um so i think that's that's why i decided to play and continue my career This is Social Justice in Women's Hockey, a new series of critical conversations about the role of women's hockey in the fight against oppression. I am your host, Erica Lindsay Ayala. Tonight, we are joined by Yale alumna Soroya Tinker. In our conversation, Tinker and I discuss racism in Canada, white gaze and the black superwoman trope, as well as why Tinker herself almost retired from hockey altogether. This fall, she will join the Metropolitan Riveters of the National Women's Hockey League. We thank you for joining Social Justice in Women's Hockey. We hope you will learn something from this conversation with Soroya and that you are challenged to join the fight against all forms of oppression. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Social Justice in Women's Hockey. I am your host, Erica Lindsay Ayala, and for this episode, you are about to watch my interview with Soroya Tinker. We'll get into a little bit about her college experience. Actually, you just saw a clip from Soroya's college experience, or her talking about her college experience, and that she almost didn't pursue hockey after college. So for anyone that wants to hear that conversation, I want you to stay to the end. That is a snippet from my interview with Soroya that published in the Nine newsletter. I write the hockey edition that comes out every Friday and Soroya and I stayed on to do that interview. There are a few other notes before we get into this interview. Um, First, if you haven't already, make sure you check out the full series. We have the first installment of Social Justice in Women's Hockey featured Blake Bolden and Allie Thunstrom. That's in two parts. You can find the links right here and in the show notes. I also wanted to let you know that Soroya Tinker and I discussed something called the white gaze. And I will give you a link here and you'll also see the link later in the video. Originally, when we recorded, I, as the facilitator, did some explaining of white gaze, but one, for flow, and also for realizing that I was essentially perpetuating white gaze in the way that Toni Morrison explains it, I, I took that out. So this is your challenge. We want this to be a learning space. So do a little bit of homework on white gaze. We're going to talk about that with Soroya Tinker, but again, boom, popping that link for you. Do a little bit of homework. I'm challenging you to learn a little bit about white gaze. Finally, I want to dedicate this episode to Regis Korczynski Paquette. I mentioned her in the the live that I did kind of introducing this series, and you'll hear me refer to Regis again with Soroya. I am very eager for you to learn from Soroya. Don't forget, 
white gaze, do a little homework on that. You'll learn a little bit about what Soroya has been doing. And finally, check in the links. Soroya has also been doing fundraising. She discusses some of the plans that she has for the Toronto area, but there have been a lot of things that she's been able to mobilize even on social media alone. So make sure you're following Soroya Tinker 71. And now we're going to get into the episode. All right, everyone, welcome to another edition of Social Justice in Women's Hockey. I am here with Soroya Tinker. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so we talked a little bit about the rundown and that we do want this to be a conversation, but I was telling you that um, I've never officially met you. I, I met your mom, I've met your father, and I think I saw you have a younger brother, right? I have two younger brothers, so. You get and least, more. <laughs> okay, so I think at least one of your younger brothers was at a Black Girl Hockey Club meetup in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I am acquainted with the family, but never have officially even spoken to you before. <laughs> so who is Soroya Tinker? Interview, or excuse me, in, introduce yourself um, to, to myself and everyone else. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm Soraya. I grew up in Toronto, Ontario. Um, as you said, you met my family. So um, my parents, Mandy and Harvell, my dad's black, my mom's white. Um, and I have three brothers, nine, 19 and 26. Um, and I just graduated from Yale University with my BA in history of science, medicine and public health, uh, pronouns she, her, hers. And I'll be playing for the Riveters next year in the NWHL. I, I also said that that was one of my favorite facts about you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, the is, um, very exciting. Um, but also, Soroya, because we know that there's a lot going on um, in this country. Well, I should say in North America, because um, you're a Canadian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I always fall to that, you know, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in, in the world, I should say. I also wanted to ask, how are you? <laughs> yeah, um, I think in the midst of everything going on, I am doing okay. Um, I would say I'm incredibly emotionally overwhelmed um, just with everybody reaching out. I love it and I love all, um, all of that, that people are reaching out and feel free to do that. Um, but I think overall it is tiring and it is so hard to see people go through stuff like this, especially when they are Black people and people within my community. So um, I think it's important to keep a positive outlook, but also just super important to take time to yourself and use those self-care habits that you normally have. Yeah, that's very real. I feel the same way. Even though I'm usually the one doing the interviewing, it, it can be a lot. It's very heavy. And I think all of us, whether it's coronavirus or what we saw happen to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, and what continues now to happen worldwide, everything from the, the power and the beauty of people uniting around the world to unfortunately some more of the violence and yeah. death that has come from it. So I appreciate you saying that also it can be tough even as you put yourself out there to be a resource to then re receive what comes of that. Um, but I wanted to then maybe go there. Um, the reason that, if I'm being honest, that I had reached out is because I knew that there was this new series that we wanted to start. And then I saw you be very active. And again, I had known of you and I heard great things from your family and I started following you leading up to the draft. But if I'm being honest, Soroya, it was a little bit, um, and in, in good ways, overwhelming to see someone in the women's hockey space plugged in to social justice and how that relates to race and racism in, in the world. So as things were happening um, in Minnesota, I'm just curious first to get um, some of your reactions and, and maybe who were some of the people that you immediately started talking to and then how that led to some of what we've seen you post on social media. Yeah, so I think I started posting just because I, I know that I'm educated and I know that I'm strong and I know I'm beautiful and I think that it's so important that uh, like we as black women are heard, um, especially within the hockey community, um, just because I know there's, there's not a lot of us. So it's important that I vocalize that. 
Um, and I think that the past few days have been very tough for my family just because my mom is white and my dad's black. So I think the first person I, I reached out to was my dad. Um, and at the dinner table, my parents were watching the horrifying videos that we had seen of, um, of black people being murdered. And my mom's crying and my dad's sharing like, yep, this is what has happened. I've gone through this. And I think that my mom had started to realize that like, wow, like my own husband has gone through these racial injustices. And like, and that was so hard for me to see because it was my parents connecting on a level that I hadn't necessarily seen before, um, mm -hmm. but it's so important. And then also I wanted to post because I want to educate. And I think that I, well, I know for a fact that my white family members have questions. And I think that although it's not our job to educate, it's important that we do and we communicate with the white people we're involved with um, and let them know what they can do to help. Yeah, and if you're comfortable, I'd like to maybe break that down a little bit more. Have you had a conversation as a family about what was it this time that you know made your mother react in, in, in a very particular way and, and that opened up the conversation? Um, I think it was just her seeing how it was affecting us just because i know although i'm i'm very positive on social media and whatnot like i have been affected and i have cried and i have like reached out and and talked to my friends and family members and been worshiping in my room and whatnot um so i think that that was what opened everything up just realizing how much it is has affected her own children and her husband um and i know that my my white family members are definitely open to learning and listening and i i really hope they do listen to me so yeah for sure i appreciate you breaking that down and i've already made a, a mistake of claiming you for america uh one time already but uh you know i think a question that i often have as as a black latina who grew up in the united states is what does this look like? What does racism look like in other places? And again, Canada and the United States are so close and the cultures I think a lot of people um, think are very similar, but I, I'm curious if as someone who's been in the States, you know, for school, obviously, do you see a difference between how conversations happen when you are in the United States versus when you're having these conversations in Canada? Yeah. Um, so as a as a black woman in Canada, I think that I've experienced it um, just as much as I have in, in the States, as I think that some of my biggest moments of racism in hockey have occurred in Canada. Um, I just think that there's a big difference in how it's portrayed in the U.S. So I think in the U.S., I posted about overt versus covert racism. I think in the United States covert ra um, overt racism is way more um, vocalized and like pushed out in social media and whatnot. Whereas in Canada, I think things are more covert in the way they're handled. Um, and I also think that we manage to brush things under the rug more so than than the United States does. But it happens here, and it happens in my own community, and it's it's time for change. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Again, I appreciate you breaking that down having never been Canadian before, uh, you know, I think that that is important. And, you know, honestly, I, I, I hear what you're saying about overt versus covert, uh, especially because, I mean, you know, the prime minister is very popular of Canada, is very popular. But I'll be honest, it only came across my radar, some of the, you know, mistakes that he made. Uh, as a young yeah. man and wearing blackface within, I think, the last year. And I'm like, as someone who's pretty dialed in, uh, you know, how did I miss that there is a leader of the world? Maybe it's because of who I'm dealing with here in the States. But, you know, how did, how did I miss, you know, that there was the, the prime minister of Canada in a state or excuse me, in a country that we hear, you know, oh, no. Nope, we don't have that problem. That's that's those yeah. people in the south of us, you know. But that you had a someone who in their past wore blackface. I mean, what do you remember the conversations being around uh, that in Canada? 
Yeah, I, I think the problem is that there wasn't many conversations had about it. Um, and again, I think things get brushed under the rug here and people aren't um, aren't as willing to speak up about it just because we are Canadians and we're known to be nice and quiet and say sorry and apologize for, for whatnot. But I think that it's time for everybody in the world to step up and just recognize that because there's mistakes being made everywhere, not just in the States. Yeah, and you've already mentioned some of the things that you've experienced in the hockey space. Yeah. And, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're still of an age where you probably would have played with boys at some point. Yeah, I, I played for, I played with boys for three or four years of my career, so. Okay, yeah. Um, because I know that that is, you know, something that's a lot different for children th th nowadays than it was for future generations. So I just wanted yeah. to make sure, but when I speak to, women in the hockey space, particularly women who are multicultural, Black women, um, women who are from Indigenous communities, a lot of the time they talk about microaggressions in the girls and women's hockey space yes. as what they deal with, but they talk about that overt racism, even if we're talking about Canada, that that has happened when they played with boys. I'm just yes. curious, um, in what ways do you relate to some of that? Um, I, I honestly would say that it's not much different whether I've played with the boys or the girls. Um, I think that in the girls game, I've probably received more comments just because I, I've been able to recognize them um, as I played with them when I'm older. But I think that it's still, it, it, the microaggressions are real and they don't realize what they're saying and they don't realize that how that hurts us and what I have to go home to after practice, mm -hmm. um, hearing those comments and having to break those down for myself and having to return to the white space the next day as well, so. Right, very big. And you know, I mentioned to you offline that I want to talk about something called white gaze. And I wanna to get to that in a minute. But thinking about, again, this show is truly dedicated to the women's hockey space. And thinking about some of the things that you've been able to share, and even it sounds like maybe some of the conversations that you've had. Yeah. What is your hope for women's hockey moving forward in this moment where there are people like yourself or even Blake Bolden, who was on the show, who said that, it, you know, this is some of the first times that she's even felt comfortable talking about this as a black and like the black women's hockey player, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, what are, What is your hope for the women's hockey culture moving forward? Yeah, so I'll go I'll go back to my my freshman and sophomore year. I would say I definitely wasn't comfortable speaking up to what I was experiencing. And I think that throughout my upperclassmen years, I was able to just develop that confidence and know that it it's it was on me to educate my team because I was the only one um, up until my senior year. But I think that my hope for the game is just that our my white teammates are able to call out other white teammates. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing, because I think that once white people start calling out other white people, that's where people will listen, because people clearly haven't listened to us for years. So I think my hope is just for people to start being able to vocalize and express that they're upset with the comments that are made and the way we're treated in the game. There's this feeling, and and honestly, maybe even as a, as a society, we allow this excuse that in order to talk about black people or in order to talk about racism, um, particularly if it's perpetuated against black people, you have to be black to talk about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think that again, sometimes we just allow that, that to be, oh, well, I have to learn about black people from black people. Um, yeah. You know, what would you say uh, to that as we move from 2020 and beyond? Yeah, I, I think it is so important to talk to your Black friends and, and Black teammates and whatnot. And I think that once you receive that education and once you think that you understand and know that you understand, I think that it should be passed on. So I know that my my captain that has been announced for Yale Women's Hockey next year, she's made an effort to reach out to me and ask me what I think should be done on the team. Even though I'm not a part of Yale Women's Hockey anymore, um, as an alum, I want it to continue. and for that space to be inclusive for Kirsten Good, who is another black player at Yale Women's Hockey now. Um, so I think that it's awesome that they're reaching out, but I think that it's so important that once white people are educated enough that they pass it on to other white people who don't understand. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I've been kind of using this phrase as like build your team, right? And your yeah. team doesn't have to be all black people. Like build your team also that you want to influence. And, yeah. and if that's you as a white person or however one identifies. If you're struggling, then maybe think of someone else who's struggling too and bring them along on the journey. So I love that you said that. And I, I think it's great though that you, again, are making yourself available, but even more so that yeah. you're empowering people to say, hey, I'm here, but also like you, you're going to have to take off the, the training <laughs> wheels at some point, you know? <laughs> so I mentioned the term white gaze and I want to I think I think if I point here then when I do this in editing it'll fix it. but uh <laughs> I'm gonna put a link to Toni Morrison um she gave this interview it's, it's very famous um, um I'm just curious what is your you know familiarity with Toni Morrison and the concept of white gaze and how do you relate to that yeah, so I actually, I wrote a bit about that in my my senior thesis at Yale. Um, so I think that this goes along with white people never being able to fully understand, but knowing that they can stand with us. Um, so in my thesis, I talk about um, the superwoman trope. And I think this is the first thing that comes to mind when you say that. Um, and the superwoman trope, for anybody who doesn't know, is that feeling as black women needing to be strong and independent um, and kind of hide and not express our true feelings and emotions. Um, so I think that's what I mostly relate it to. But again, I think that as when when she's writing, I think that you we as black people don't have to under we don't have to explain that to other black people. And I think that's something that white people need to understand. Um, yeah. They'll never understand, but they can stand with us. <laughs> right. And I think that goes back to, you know, this balance between being a resource and being a crutch. We started with how are you? Because these con these conversations are always a part of the Black experience, from my experience. Yeah. But we're heightened with not only the emotions that we feel now, because of, again, Breonna Taylor and... George Floyd, but now everyone else. Yeah. Also getting to that point, which is almost like our baseline. Uh, so wh what are the ways that you're dealing with that? Um, yeah. So I think that, as I mentioned and have posted, I think that, that I'm dealing with that just by being able to educate myself even more on other Black experiences and, and just getting like word from other Black friends and and sharing those experiences and then being able to educate others just because I think that there's such a lack of understanding. And once people make an effort to understand and educate themselves, that's where change is going to be made. Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to, you know, get really real here because I also, and this is, this is my take for you to argue as you see fit, but I also feel that sometimes, and it's not just the black community because I also identify with the, the Latina community which for some people yeah. in that community is very problematic that I also identify as black, whole nother podcast topic. <laughs> I also think though that, that, that what you said about education is really important because I think there are ways yeah. that anybody truly, but even you know, well-meaning members of the black community also perpetuate some of the exact things that we're talking about. And honestly, and this goes back to the civil rights movement. Um, that looks very different for black women in struggle movements and black yeah. women being asked to or being expected to put in certain work without also being able to be appreciated in real time for that work. Um, I'm just curious, getting your thoughts on that particular aspect of right now of what we're dealing with of the fact that and this seems almost ridiculous to say because death is death but there are people who will say the name George Floyd but maybe don't know about Breonna Taylor yeah will elevate Eric Garner and maybe not Sandra Bland or Erica Garner for that matter yeah who, also, we've, we've lost to this fight. Just your thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I think as Black women, again, as the superwoman trope, like we endure so much. And I think it's like imperative as as Black women to support each other and stand behind one another, especially in sport, because I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to attend an Ivy League school, and I wouldn't have had that opportunity without hockey. And so I think that as a Black woman in sport, I know that it's my job to step up and say something and support other Black women. And I think that it's so important that we reach out to our, our black, black female friends and like let them know that we're there for them and stand behind what we're saying, no matter the subject. The way you've been able to articulate things, I think has also resonated with people, which yeah you know, in and of itself could be another another thesis category, right? Being, having a way of packaging things versus, you know, another trope that we hear of the angry black woman, um, yeah. you know, but I think that your poise has really resonated with people. And even Blake, when she was on the show, uh, had nothing but, you know, high praise and stick taps to you. Um, yeah felt that at, at your age, she she was not able to do that. She's just coming into that space. And as I, again, as I said before, I've never had this conversation because I was always, I felt honestly muffled. Like I didn't want to rock the boat too much. I was getting a lot of attention just for the color of my skin. And some people are saying, oh, well, why is she getting a, you know, attention just because of the color of her skin? Like we don't see color. Why is that a big deal? But it is a big deal. Actually, it is a big deal because I didn't have someone that looked like me because I went through some ish growing up playing in this sport, you know? I don't think that you guys had to do that. Well, I'm pretty sure that you didn't. So let's just all understand so we can cut the crap and not let this happen or at least be aware of it. So if it does, we understand what to do and how to handle it and what to talk about and how to support each other. So... I hope that the conversations happen in women's hockey because I don't know. I mean, Soraya, is that how you say her name? Soraya. Oh, Soraya Tinker. Soraya Tinker. I mean, she is just like, bam, 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 bam. And I'm like, go ahead, girl, because when I was your age, I couldn't do that because it wasn't time. It wasn't the right move at that moment. I didn't, I didn't have the support. People would have been like, this crazy angry black woman you know and that's such that statement right there is just so disheartening to hear like that angry black woman that that shouldn't be the situation you know i i am very aware that i will absolutely never fully understand um what you've gone through and what anyone in our black community goes through but I absolutely want to change that conversation and have it be something that isn't taboo. And Blake's reached out to me and, and we've talked to each other. And I think it's, I think that's another reason why I'm stepping up just because I, I've realized I didn't have many role models um, when I was growing up in the game. And I think that's so important. And I had a lot of young girls reach out to me, which is so encouraging. And I encourage more to do so just because I, I am there to support them. Um, but I think it's so important as black female athletes to stand behind each other. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, which is why I'm so glad we were able to get you on the show. As I mentioned, I know you're going to be chatting with Renee Hess of Black Girl Hockey Club on a live IG, so we we'll want to make sure you have enough time to head over for that. But Soroya, as, as we start to wind down, I mean, we've talked about a lot of different things. You also have talked about educating yeah. yourself, but... On the show, we really want to talk about social justice in a way that women's hockey in particular has never done before. Um, what would you like yeah. to leave folks with as far as a message or ways to be encouraged or even other things that you're going to do to commit to this conversation long term? Yeah, so um, currently I'll say that I am working on a peaceful protest in Toronto. Um, and I'm just encouraging people to educate yourselves, learn and listen. Um, it's so important and, and reach out. Uh, maybe the words aren't, how are you? But there are many ways that you can reach out and, and check on your, your, your friends of color and your black friends. So I think that's so important and just, just to have an open mind and be there, listen and educate yourselves. <laughs> All right, I love it. Protests in Toronto. Um, I think the, well, there was a woman, I, I don't know all the details. Is it Regis? Um, 
I'm not remembering the full name, but there's a, a instance where her family is is claiming that she was pushed off a balcony. Um, oh yes, yeah, that happened um, sometime last week. Um, and again, like I said, in Canada, we're much better at sleeping it on the under the rug. So uh, I definitely think it's important that we recognize that. Um, and and I think that the peaceful protest will definitely be um, impactful for many people. Okay, Soroya, so I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, your transition from college to the professional level. Um, you know, what has that, that everything from the draft to, you know, now presumably getting yourself prepared for the fall, what has that been like for you so far? Yeah, um, so for those who don't know, I actually was planning on retiring after my Yale career just because I was, I was sick of the game and I was um, tired of the stuff I had been put through. Um, but I think that my senior year coach that came in, um, that started coaching my senior year, he really helped me love the game again. So that's when I started talking to the NWHL teams. Um, and I think that preparing for professional, I think I'm just looking at getting stronger and, and faster. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to being on the Riveters. I, it's so exciting. And I, I didn't expect to go fourth overall, but I mean, Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to backtrack just a little bit because, I mean, athletes in college getting worn out by the game is something that you hear a lot. Um, so how much of it was just kind of the grind and what's expected of a, of, an, of a student athlete? And how much of that was some of what we talked about in our other conversation as far as, again, being someone who is Black in a space where traditionally speaking and, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of other people that look like you yeah i think so for for me it wasn't the stress and the 40 hours a week and the the balancing of time in school and hockey and whatnot i think for me it, it really was the white space i was in each day um mm -hmm. so i think that's what became like just it was so tiring and um i think that's what made me fall out of love with the game um because i think anybody who knows me knows i'm i'm a total hardo like anybody wants to work out like let's go do it like I'm always down I'm always ready to work hard and, and improve on whatever I need to um so I think that that's probably the the main part of the game that was just so tiring and and I just wanted it to end um but I think that through all this I realized that it it is my job to to be there as a voice for other women of color who are coming up in the game and in sport in general um, so I think that's that's why I decided to play and continue my career. I wonder about this because Blake said something to this effect. That is very natural. That's very real. Um, but I also wonder if you've allowed yourself to think of, you know, is is it because you're a hockey player that that seems to be like an acute um, frustration of yours? Or do you ever wonder if you weren't a hockey player, if that would be different I don't know one way or another mm -hmm. um speaking specifically to at Yale I know that it would be different if I was not in a hockey space um most of my best friends are on women's soccer team um and I've made close friends with them just because I know that their team atmosphere is more inclusive and and whatnot so I do think it is specifically hockey um that was tiring me out with this Wow. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. <laughs> and you said uh, that there was a, a coach that made you fall back in love with with hockey and, and really yeah. needed to, to reassess. I mean, how much of that was just being able to kind of, you know, take a breath and reset? Or were there things that this coach was able to do to maybe, you know, help mitigate some of the, the frustration that you were feeling because of being Black in a hockey space at Yale? Yeah, no, I, I think that it was definitely on my coach. Um, he he was so willing and open to learning about me, myself, like pers personality wise. Um, I, I ha usually have a bit of a wall up. I'm hard to get through. Um, always always smiling, but I know that it can. I'm not the easiest to talk to about personal things often. Um, I don't always put that out there. But he made an effort to get to know me on that level, um, whether it was calling me into the office and just having a casual conversation with me or looking to our athletic de department to um, 
see what they can do about our diversity and inclusion training. Um, so I think that that's really what encouraged me and kept me going um, and make and made me want to continue playing by the end of the season.